for several nights at the end of August 1990. Stevie Ray Vaughan and his band Double Trouble were the support act for Eric Clapton at the Alpine Valley Music Theatre in East Troy, Wisconsin. Clapton later said he had resisted watching Vaughan play until the last night to keep my own kind of self-esteem up, because I wouldn't have been able to go on otherwise. I'm not joking. To have been completely absorbed by what Stevie was doing, I would have thought, what's the point, and done a runner and cleared off. When Clapton finally did watch Vaughan play, he recalled, we had all of us standing around with our jaws dropped. I mean, Robert Cray and Jimmy Vaughan and Buddy Guy and I were just watching in awe. There was no one better than him on this planet. Really unbelievable. Half an hour after the concert finished, Stevie Ray Vaughan was dead. A helicopter that took him to his hotel in Chicago crashed minutes after takeoff. Vaughan's passing deeply shocked the music world, not least because he was only 35 and had enjoyed international recognition for only seven years. The abrupt end of a stellar career that was still only in its early stages was traumatic for everyone who loved blues music and guitar playing. During his seven years at the top, Stevie Ray Vaughan had lit up the world of music with his version of the blues, which had been in danger of becoming a forgotten genre by the early 80s, when Michael Jackson, Madonna, synth pop, and MTV ruled. Stevie Ray Vaughan was instrumental in making blues and blues guitar relevant again. When he was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2015, his contribution was lauded as the second coming of the blues and he was called the Messiah Shredding with B.B. King's Blessing. Guitarist John Mayer presented the induction speech and called Vaughan the ultimate guitar hero. One could also say that Stevie Ray Vaughan was the second coming of Jimi Hendrix, because there are striking similarities between the playing styles and the feel of the two guitarists, even to the point of Vaughan also playing behind his back and with his teeth. Music poured out of both guitarists like an endless tsunami. And while Hendrix laid many of the foundations for new developments in rock, Vaughan did the same for blues. So who was Stevie Ray Vaughan? And what made him such a great guitarist that Eric Clapton did not dare to watch him live? And that Vaughan is to this day regularly included in the top 10 lists of best guitarists of all time. Stevie Ray Vaughan's roots are in Texas, where he was born in Dallas on October the 3rd, 1954. His older brother, Jimmy, was born in 1951, and their father was an alcoholic who frequently terrorized the family. Jimmy became a proficient guitarist very quickly, and Stevie tried to imitate him. He received a Sears toy guitar at the age of seven, and in his teens, he often played his brother's guitars, for example, a Gibson ES125T which was given to him by his brother in 1963, when Stevie was still only nine. Later, he played his brother's Fender Broadcaster, which he had traded for an Epiphone Riviera. Being three and a half years older, Jimmy was a strong influence on his younger brother. A couple of uncles taught both brothers some guitar basics, but for the rest, Stevie learned mostly by listening to records and blues radio broadcasts from Chicago and Nashville. Jimmy often bought records from home, and Stevie closely analyzed the playing of guitarists like Hendrix, Albert King, Lonnie Mack, Freddie King, Buddy Guy, Muddy Waters, B.B. King, and many others, often learning to play their solos note for note. Stevie later said, between listening to the feeling in the music on the records and watching my brother and how much feeling he had with it, I picked up big time inspiration. I don't know where it came from, it just happened. My brother Jimmy showed me some stuff and then it was like the dam broke. Another big support for the young Stevie was Clifford Anton, the owner of the well-known Anton's Blues Club in Austin, Texas. He allowed Stevie to go on stage often and arranged for him to sit in with blues legends like Albert King, Freddie King, Albert Collins, Buddy Guy, and so on. What is less recognized is that Vaughan was also strongly influenced by British blues guitarists like Peter Green, Jeff Beck, and most of all, Eric Clapton. As I was hearing the original blues masters from the States, um, I was also hearing the English blues boom at the same time. So not only was I getting the original, but I was getting this um, 
updated, energized version of the same thing. So I had less reservations and less reasons to be so-called a purist. And therefore, I wasn't as restricted about what I could learn. For instance, okay, Freddie King does Hideaway Like. <laughs> Clapton does it like this. Yeah, there's, there's a small difference there. Stevie practiced as much as five hours every day, though he was initially hampered by his unhappy home environment and lack of support from his parents. It meant that he had to go out and do odd jobs, like working at a hamburger stand. By 1965, when Vaughan was still only 11, he was good enough to join a band, the Chantones. He very quickly decided the band was not good enough for him, and he went to play in a band called Brooklyn Underground, which performed professionally in local venues. In 1969, when he was just 14 years old, Stevie joined a band called Southern Distributor. However, they were not impressed with his suggestion to play the blues, so he left. It galvanized his dedication to the genre. In that same year, Jimmy Vaughan met Jimi Hendrix in Fort Worth, Texas. Hendrix borrowed Vaughan's wah-wah pedal for a gig, and when he broke it, gave Vaughan his own wah-wah pedal. By the end of 1969, Stevie met bassist Tommy Shannon, who much later became the bassist in his band. During the 70s, Stevie cut his teeth playing in a variety of bands, including Liberation, Casts of Thousands, Blackbird, Cracker Jack, The Nightcrawlers, and Paul Ray and the Cobras. In 1977, he formed his own band, Triple Threat Revenue. Stevie recorded a number of tracks with several of these bands, and one evening sat in with the famous Texas blues rock band ZZ Top. A witness recalled about the event, they tore the house down. It was awesome. It was one of those magical evenings Stevie fit in like a glove on a hand. By 1978, there were personnel changes in Triple Threat Revenue, and Vaughan changed the name of the band to Double Trouble, after an Otis Rush song. Two years later, a classic lineup of Double Trouble was established, with Chris Layton on drums and Tommy Shannon on bass. Around the same time, Vaughan's problems with substance abuse came to light. As he was arrested for cocaine use, it led to a sentence of two years of probation. By 1980, Double Trouble had become one of the most popular live acts in Texas, but still failed to gain much attention outside of the state. This changed after record producer Jerry Rexler heard the band play. Rexler was known for his work with Ray Charles, Led Zeppelin and Aretha Franklin, and had a nose for discovering unknown but exceptional talent. He called Vaughan a jewel, one of those rarities who comes along once in a lifetime. Rexler strongly recommended Double Trouble to Claude Nobbs of the Montreux Festival. Nobbs took a gamble on the unknown unsigned act and booked them for the festival's Blues Night on July the 17th, 1982. Reports of the concert are conflicting. One reviewer had it that the trio reduced the stage into a pile of smoking cinders. But there was also a lot of booing, presumably because the music was too loud and wild for the purists in the audience. Backstage after the concert, Vaughn was visibly distressed. At this point, he was not aware yet that David Bowie had watched him in action. Bowie later said, Stevie completely floored me. I probably hadn't been so gung-ho about a guitar player since seeing Jeff Beck with his pre-Yardbirds band the Tridents. The evening after the Montreux Festival concert, Double Trouble played at the Montreux Casino, where another famous artist was in the audience, Jackson Brown. Brown ended up jamming with the band and invited Vaughan and his band to record in his Los Angeles studio downtown. As a result of his performances at Montreux, Stevie Ray Vaughan's career suddenly and very dramatically took an upward turn on two fronts at the same time. First, there were the recording sessions at downtown, 
Brown had offered three days of free recording time, and with one day used for setting up, engineer Richard Mullen recorded 10 songs live in a studio in two days, without any overdubs. Mullen later recalled, I just had one mic on everything. I used two Shaw SM57s on his guitar amps, one on a Fender Vibroverb with a 15-inch Altic Lansing speaker, and one on a Dumble 412 bottom with Electra Voice speakers, connected to a Dumble head. Stevie played through two vibroverbs, but I only mic'd one of the speakers in one of them. I positioned the mics about three or four inches off the cabinet at about a 45 degree angle to the cone. The only effect he used was an Ibanez tuba screamer. A copy of the recordings made its way to John Hammond, another legendary figure in the American music industry, who played a key role in the careers of Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Robert Johnson, Aretha Franklin, and countless others. Impressed by what he heard, Hammond recommended Vaughan to Epic Records. A contract was signed in March of 1983 with an advance of $65,000 to mix and master the recordings. Meanwhile, David Bowie had called Vaughan during the sessions at Downtown and asked him to play on his next album. Reportedly, the two had already met briefly in Montreux. Vaughan later commented, To tell you the truth, I wasn't very familiar with David's music when he asked me to play on the sessions. David and I talked for hours and hours about our music, about funky Texas blues and its roots. I was amazed at how interested he was. The sessions for what was to become Bowie's famous Let's Dance album took place over three weeks in December of 1982 at the Power Station in New York, with Niall Rogers producing and playing rhythm guitar, and Bob Clearmountain at the desk. Niall Rogers initially was not overly enthusiastic about Bowie's new discovery, as he felt that Vaughan sounded too much like Albert King. Moreover, Bowie had on his previous albums work with guitarists like Robert Fripp and Adrian Ballou, who were perfectly suited for his British art rock. An unknown blues guitarist from Texas did not appear an obvious choice. Bowie convinced Rogers to give Vaughan a chance, and the blues guitarist traveled to New York shortly before Christmas of 1982. Jimmy Vaughan remembered, Stevie called me to tell me he had met up with David Bowie and Nile Rogers in New York, and I think they recorded him pretty quickly. It was only one day or something for the guitar. He just overdubbed himself onto the tracks. He only needed one or two takes. He just went in there all fired up and did his thing. On March the 14th, 1983, the song Let's Dance was released as an advanced single of the album. This was around the same time that Vaughan and Double Trouble signed with Epic, and the connection with Bowie will have focused the record company's mind in signing him and offering him a decent advance. Let's Dance became an overnight and worldwide success. It went to number one in dozens of countries and ended up being one of the best-selling and most influential songs of all time. We covered it in our Songs That Change Music series in 2020. The combination of the funk rock pop production masterminded by Rogers, Bowie's masterful vocals, and Clear Mountain's amazing recording and mix, and the stunning blues guitar playing by Vaughan floored pretty much everyone. The album itself was released in April of 1983, featuring the same funk rock pop music as the title song, with Vaughan soloing on six of the tracks. It was also a major success, eventually selling more than 10 million copies worldwide. Bowie had negotiated that Vaughan would be part of his touring band, and he did indeed perform with Bowie's band in Dallas, Texas on April the 27th, 1983, in preparation for the Sirius Moonlight Tour. However, reportedly Bowie's management did not honor the agreement for Vaughan and Double Trouble to be the support act on the tour, and Vaughan's manager canceled the entire arrangement. He asked me to do the tour with Double Trouble opening up. Right. And uh, well, no, we were never even on the show. Really? He just wanted me to play with him. Yeah, so you got a pretty raw deal. Yeah, so I didn't go. Stevie Ray Vaughan's name was on everybody's lips in the spring of 1983 and many music fans were disappointed not to see Vaughan perform with Bowie. But the silver lining was that it freed up Vaughan to concentrate on promoting his own upcoming release. Epic released his debut album, Texas Flood, on June 13, 1983, under the name Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble. Mixed by Lincoln Clapp with John Hammond as executive producer, the album was well received by critics, with most reactions like, the most exciting guitarist to come out of Texas since Johnny Winter. The album sold well, helped by the fact there was an audience out there hungry to hear more by the mysterious guitarist who had set Bowie's Let's Dance album alight. 
Texas Flood went double platinum in the US, selling two million copies. Two songs from Texas Flood were nominated for Grammy Awards. Pride and Joy, the best traditional blues performance award, and Rude Mood for the best rock instrumental performance award. In 2021, the album was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame because of its historical significance. In just a few months during 1983, Stevie Ray Vaughan had gone from unknown Texas guitarists playing in local bars and clubs to one of the most famous and talked about guitarists in the world. In some respects, his impact was similar to that of Jimi Hendrix's arrival on the international music scene. Famously, on the night of November 25th, 1966, the unknown Hendrix jumped on stage at the Bag and Nails Club in London to perform Howling Wolf's Killing Floor with Cream. Eric Clapton left the stage halfway through the song in shock and bewilderment. He was found backstage nervously smoking and saying, nobody told me he was that effing good. Clapton later remarked, Jimmy was amazing. And he was musically great too, not just pyrotechnics. When Clapton first heard Stevie Ray Vaughan play in 1983, he also had a very strong reaction. He recalled I was driving and Let's Dance came on the radio. I stopped my car and said, I have to know who this guitar player is today. Not tomorrow, but today. That has only happened to me three or four times ever, and probably not for anyone in between Dwayne Allman and Stevie. Stevie Ray Vaughan clearly knocked everyone out in 1983. He could have been a flash in the pan, but nearly 40 years later, he is still regarded as one of the greatest guitarists who ever lived. There's an intensity to Stevie's guitar playing that only he could achieve still to stay. It's a rage without the anger. It's devotional. It's religious. He seamlessly melded the supernatural vibe of Jimi Hendrix, the intensity of Albert King, the best of British, Texas, and Chicago blues, and the class and sharpshooter precision of his older brother, Jimmy. Vaughan's searing incendiary guitar style had a feel that was a direct extension of Hendrix and Lonnie Mack. Vaughan's phrasing and choice of notes were strongly influenced by pretty much all blues guitarists that came before him. Vaughan's playing also was founded in the directness and aggression of Texas blues, British blues, and rock. In addition, Vaughan was influenced by jazz guitarists like Django Reinhardt, Wes Montgomery, Kenny Burrell, and George Benson. Vaughan was able to incorporate this wide range of influences into the style of guitar playing that was uniquely his own, and also included a capacity to play outside of the box. Vaughan's approach to the guitar was characterized by a strong left-hand vibrato perpendicular to the strings that was at the root of the soulful singing feel of his playing, and by a powerful bright tone with moderate distortion. Vaughan's guitar tone was the result of many different factors. First of all, there was Vaughan's love of Stratocasters, which he usually played through two black-faced Fender Super Reverbs, with the Ibanez Tube Screamer and the Vox Wah-Wah as his main effects, even as he also experimented with others. Vaughan played many different guitars during his life. His favorite guitar was a beaten up Strat, which he called Number One, or My First Wife, and declared it to be from 1959. However, the various parts of the Strat were from different years, with the body from 1963, the neck from 1962, and the pickups from 1959. Fender created an artist's signature SRV Stratocaster based on number one. Vaughan named his second favorite guitar, a 1959 Stratocaster, Lenny, after his first wife, Lenora. Vaughan also often played a guitar custom made for him by Jim Hamilton. Other guitars he used included Scotch, a 1961 Stratocaster, and Charlie, a Stratocaster-style guitar custom made by Charlie Wurz with three Dan Electro lipstick pickups. But at the heart of his tone were Vaughan's large, powerful hands, which he used to hit heavy gauge strings very, very hard, using a pick of medium thickness, usually a Fender 0.73 millimeters. Vaughan's strings have been described as being as thick as barbed wire. However, his favored string setup was a composite of different sets, with a thickness of 13, 15, 19 plain, 28, 38, and 58. The bottom E is heavier than in a regular 13 set, allowing for big bass. Then the middle four strings are thinner than those in a 13 set. One could also say that Vaughan's custom set was somewhere between a medium and heavy gauge 10 or 11, with extra thick top and bottom E strings, 
but it made the middle four strings easier to bend, allowing him to play with the characteristic up and down vibrato. Moreover, Vaughan tended to tune his strings a half step lower to E flat, which did not only give him a slightly deeper tone, but also reduced string tension, again enabling strong bending and vibrato. Finally, Vaughan's action was higher than usual, which meant that when he hit the strings hard with the thicker end of his picks, it would create a cleaner, bell-like tone with more sustain that was ideally suited to the aggressive, rock-like feel of his playing. All of these elements made Vaughan a consummate guitar player, who updated blues for the late 20th century and influenced guitar players all over the world. The relentless intensity and creativity of his playing floored audiences wherever he performed during the seven years that he spent at the top. His studio albums also continued to be successful. However, there were also several dark clouds on the horizon, mostly brought on by his drugs and alcohol addictions. Building on the momentum and the releases of Let's Dance and Texas Flood, Vaughan spent a large part of 1983 touring. In January 1984, he recorded his second studio album at the Power Station in New York, again with Richard Mullen at the controls and John Hammond executive producing. Couldn't Stand the Weather was released in May of 1984 and has been called a major turning point in Stevie Ray Vaughan's development because of his improved songwriting and vocal skills. It has to date sold 2 million copies. 1984 also saw a legendary performance by Vaughan and Double Trouble at Carnegie Hall with Dr. John on keyboards and a brass section. In 1997, the performance was released as Live at Carnegie Hall. Stevie Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble's third studio album, Soul to Soul, was recorded at the Dallas Sound Lab in the spring of 1985, with Richard Mullen once again at the controls and keyboardist Reese Winans added to the band. Released in September of 1985, Soul to Soul sold well enough, but by Vaughan's own admission, it suffered from a lack of focus and songwriting inspiration, in part due to his drugs and alcohol abuse. The same problems marred Live Alive, a record compiled from live performances in Montreux, Austin, and Dallas, and released in November of 1986. Two months before the release, the Vaughan juggernaut had come to a halt when he collapsed on tour in Germany. When he checked into a private hospital in London, he was told that if he continued his drugs habit, he'd only have a month more to live. I woke up one morning on a tour bus in Germany. I couldn't hardly get up. I was scared of everything. My friends, just being awake, I was scared. I tried to say hi to my bass player and I started crying. I was uh, a wreck, and uh, I realized right then that the only way to win this thing was to give up, and I did. What did you do? I had a breakdown. <laughs> yeah. That, thank God that happened, because then I was able to ask for help, as opposed to, I'll make it through this. Yeah. I'll make it through it if I ask for help is the reality of it. Vaughn spent time in rehab clinic in Atlanta and later in Austin, and managed to kick his drugs and alcohol addictions. Afterwards, he continued to be vocal about the issue in an effort to warn others not to go down the same path. Vaughn was on the road again by November of 1986. However, the next obstacle in his career occurred soon afterwards. In January of 1987, when he filed for divorce from his wife, Lenora Lenny Bailey. While he continued to tour, the divorce proceedings meant that he could not move forward with his recording career for two years. By January of 1989, he was finally free to start recording his fourth studio album. Richard Mullen was once again at the desk, together with Jim Gaines, who also co-produced together with Double Trouble. The recordings took place at Kiva Studios in Memphis, Tennessee, and Soundcastle and Summer Studios in Los Angeles. Released in June of 1989, it was called in step, because, commented Vaughan, I'm finally in step with life, in step with myself, in step with my music. Vaughan had been nervous about his capacity to deliver musically while being sober, but critical reaction to the album was enthusiastic, with All Music calling it a triumph, adding, Vaughan found his own songwriting voice, blending blues, soul, and rock in unique ways, and writing with a startling emotional honesty. 
The song Crossfire went to number one in the US rock charts, and the album sold well over two million copies. It also earned Vaughan and Double Trouble a Grammy in the category Best Contemporary Blues Recording. Vaughan continued with his relentless touring schedule, and in 1990 worked on an album with his brother Jimmy called Family Life. It was produced by Niall Rogers and recorded at Ardent Studios in Memphis, the Dallas Sound Lab, and Skyline Studios in New York City. Released at the end of September, Family Life reached to number seven in the US and earned the Vaughan Brothers two Grammy Awards, the Best Contemporary Blues Recording win for the album and Best Rock Instrumental Performance for the track D slash FW. Stevie Ray Vaughan was no longer around to witness the acclaim for Family Life. His shocking death on August the 27th, 1990, stopped the promise of much more to come in its tracks. His passing was difficult to come to terms with for fans and guitarists all over the world. The fact that it happened so soon after he finally kicked his drugs habit and played better than ever seemed unfairly cruel. There's just a lot more reasons to live now, Vaughan had said in an interview in 1988. I can honestly say that I'm really glad to be alive today. Because left to my own devices, I would have slowly killed myself. There are a lot of things that I was running from, and one of them was me. I've made a commitment now, not for the rest of my life, just for today. Now, each day's a new victory. Sadly, by August 27th, Stevie Ray Vaughan's days were up. Among those present at his funeral on August the 31st were Eric Clapton, Stevie Wonder, Buddy Guy, Dr. John, Jeff Healy, Charlie Sexton, Billy Gibbons, Bonnie Raitt, Jackson Brown, and Nile Rogers. The state of Texas went into deep mourning. Yet, even as Vaughan ran out of time far too early, his victories live on. He remains as relevant a guitar player today as he was during his life. Countless guitarists have recorded songs in his memory, among them Eric Johnson, Tommy Emmanuel, Buddy Guy, and Steve Vai. Vaughan also has been a strong influence on an entire new generation of guitarists. During his heyday, they included players like Robert Cray, Jeff Healy, Robin Ford, and Walter Trout. And some of the younger players who have name-checked him are Joe Bonamassa, John Mayer, Robert Randolph, Kenny Wayne Shepherd, John Petrucci, and Doyle Bramall II. John Mayer put Stevie Ray Vaughan's achievement very succinctly. He took the spirit and style of every blues guitarist who had ever lived and put it into one modern day language. In doing so, Vaughan became perhaps not quite the messiah, but certainly the leading light in American blues. So I feel truly blessed. In that year, 1983, Stevie Ray Vaughan blew up all over the world. And for a kid like me in England, just learning to play guitar, All of us were just obsessed. What is this guitar player? Let's Dance was out. We heard this guitar playing. He was suddenly in all the guitar magazines. Everybody was talking about this guy, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Well, we were blessed in the UK because he came and played Reading Rock Festival. Now, where I grew up in my village, in Crookham Village, Reading Rock Festival, I don't know, 15 miles away? It's close, anyway. And we would go there nearly every year. and. I got to see him. I got to see him play eight songs, one of which was him doing a cover of Voodoo Child by Jimi Hendrix. And all my hairs are standing on end thinking about it. I've got to say, John Mayer really put it, he did put it succinctly. Because you can tell there's some Hendrix in Stevie's playing. The fact that he nails Voodoo Child gives it every ounce that Jimmy did, but also does his own spin. He pays so much homage, so much respect to the original, but also then does his own thing. They're both amazing and exist together. But yeah, Stevie's Stevie's way of playing that the the, the Texas blues kind of just like that right hand stuff with the open strings ringing and just the way that he just attacked blues scales. He attacked pentatonic minors that just, in patterns and and just had an absolutely incredible flow. Nobody played like that. It was interesting because I remember reading in Guitarist or Guitar Player about the Let's Dance album when they interviewed him. 
And he said, yeah, I was just figuring out what Albert King or Freddie King riff to put wherever I wanted. And that's what's so great about him. If you only heard Let's Dance, you would think that he was this simple, beautifully soulful blues guitar player that just knew how to phrase gorgeously. But then you heard him play Hendrix and he blew your mind because he had a command of a wah-wah pedal, which was only ever equaled by Jimi Hendrix himself. And he could play straight ahead blues. He could play rock blues. He was just everything. And now you go into a guitar store, spend a day in a guitar store. Guarantee there'll be three, four, five guitar players that will come in playing that kind of Texas blues meets classic blues meets a bit of British blues, a bit of everything. And it's all him. Now it's commonplace. Everybody tries to sound like Stevie. But when it came out, that blend was revolutionary. I'm not saying there wasn't other people that played bits and pieces like that. Of course they did. But he became the guy. He led it. If there is a guitar player outside of Jimmy, outside of all the classic blues guitar players that we could talk about, if there's one other person that can hold their head up and say they truly changed guitar playing, it's Stevie Ray Vaughan. Absolutely phenomenal player. Thank you everything you did for us, Stevie. I remember the day he died. It's a bit like I remember with the day that Jaco died. You remember those days really, really vividly. And when we heard that he had, somebody had given up their seat on the helicopter at the last minute so that Stevie could get back to the hotel quicker for his next show, it was devastating. It was just like how close it was that he would still be with us, sober, killing it, playing at his best. And he was taken away. Thanks ever so much for watching. If you've got any other guitar players, any other musicians, any other albums, anything else you'd like to us to talk about, please put them down below and recommend them. Thank you ever so much for watching. So long, farewell, Avida Zen, au revoir, adios, goodbye.